Welcome to the Wild Physio Podcast with your host, Andrew Wild. Today, I have Alexis Leveille on, who is also known on Instagram as No Bullshit Physio, which is right up my alley. Alexis graduated from McGill University in 2016 with a master's in physical therapy after a one-year law school detour. After one year of work in what he calls a mill clinic, Alexis started working as a self-employed physio at Ultimate in Montreal. Alexis plays competitive soccer and plays basketball and lifts weights for fun. He's also a social media meme and skit specialist. A huge welcome to Alexis. Looking forward to chatting, mate. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Let's do it. We're going to dive into some yes, no, or maybe questions as usual. And everyone listening, if you haven't checked out his Instagram, go on there. It's pretty humorous and it's also very educational. Now, let's do it. So the yes, no, or maybe question here, mate. And then from there, we're going to delve into why you said yes, no, and maybe. First one, is the sacroiliac joint very robust and doesn't move much, if at all, during movement of the body? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Can the SIJ, that, yeah. Can the SIJ go out of alignment without severe trauma? No. Is there no evidence of a relationship between SIJ, ligament laxity, and pain? Uh, no, there's none. There's no evidence? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so. Can therapists tell if the SIJ moves too much or too little? <laughs> Definitely not, no. <laughs> can, <laughs> can therapists tell if the SIJ is out of place or symmetrical? Uh, absolutely not, no. Yep. Does manipulation of the SIJ change its alignment or ability to move? No, and we've known that for like 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> we need to debunk all these myths because it pisses me off that they even exist. Do some, people with, do some people with back pain have stronger and more active core and back muscles than people without back pain due to some muscle guarding? Yes. Can facet joints sublux and then be manipulated back into place? I say with a smile on my face. <laughs> I mean, maybe they can sublux, but we can't put them back in place and yep. it need like severe trauma. Yep. Does the diagnosis of scapular dyskinesis exist? It exists, but it's stupid. Yeah, agreed. Are therapist palpation skills unreliable and not very accurate? In general, yes. Are trigger points somewhat of a myth? I and mean, should we refer to these sore spots within a muscle as hyper irritable sore spots within a muscle? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. We're done. Okay. How'd you go? I'm good. My cat's right. over here. What's your cat's name? Scooby. Sco Scooby. Yeah, like the thing you used to make kombucha. Yeah. Whatever. It's a dumb name. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's go through the sij stuff first so you said that the sij is very robust and doesn't move much let's just go through some of that in terms of not only the research but why you said that it is very robust and doesn't move yeah um sure um first of all if you look at like the literature on ligaments um they're pretty robust and like the sij is surrounded by ligaments uh it doesn't move that much at all so like the assumption they could go out is kind of ludicrous. I think it moves less like than like uh, a centimeter, which is like not that much at all. And um, I mean, I don't have the literature on hand, but yeah, it, it just doesn't move that much. And like, if it did, if someone has his SIJ out of place, they couldn't walk into the clinic. It's just, that's how strong it is. Yeah, exactly. And if that was the case, you know, they'd be presenting to the hospital because of severe trauma or something like that in a car crash. Exactly. Or like that. Yeah. So in yeah, terms yeah. of some of the research out there for the nerds out there, so Vleeming in et al. in 1990 and Schneider's et al. in 1993, they show that less than 0 0.5 degrees of movement in standing. And then Struson yeah. in 2000 and Good et al. in 2008 showed minus 1.1 to 8 degrees depending on the axis of movement and negative 0 0.3 to, 0 to 8 millimetres depending on the axis. So it doesn't really move yeah. much at all. Um, so, and it really annoys me the fact that clinicians say to people that their SIJ is out of place and we're going to put it back in, you know, and you've said to, yeah. you've answered already that therapists can't tell if it's out of place or symmetrical. 
And is that purely based on the literature or is it purely based on the fact that we're just not very good at seeing stuff on the body if, uh, there's, if there's dysfunction? I mean, I think we're not good at it because everyone's different. We can't, we don't have like x-rays on our hands. Uh, like, I think that's more than like, to me, the, the SI joint literature, the thing that's more telling is the fact that like, when you ask people to put it back in place, it doesn't move at all. Like the tall bird paper, I think is like conclusive. I don't think anyone can argue with that paper and be like, yeah, SI joint dysfunction exists. Cause like in the paper, it was, it's almost like someone at work was like, in your situation that we're tired of people talking about the SIJ and they were like, okay, I'm going to prove them how stupid they are. And they just took like, I think it was like eight therapists and they asked them to identify the dysfunction, test it, like correct it after and do the manip. And then they asked them like, did you correct it? And they were all, they all said like, yes, I corrected it. And then after that, when they went back and measured it with like actual instrument, I think it was stereo photogammetry, the SI joint didn't move at all. So it's like, they thought that they did it they were qualified, but it doesn't move at all. So it's like, why are we even bothering about this? And, me, that's, and, that's yeah. and why do you think a lot of therapists are still talking about this? Do you think it's the, what they're being taught at university? Do you think it's more of your therapist reliance methodology that tries to get people to go back regularly and then create independent dependence on the therapist? I don't think we create like therapists create dependence voluntarily. I think it's just something that they're taught in school and it's something that's like very seductive. Like it's very powerful to think that you can correct people and like fix them with your magic hands. But and it's, I mean, for me, when I learned that that wasn't the case, it was kind of disheartening because you feel like you can't do anything. Of course we can, but like, you know, it's like you're losing your superpowers. Um, so I feel like that's why people do it. I don't think it's like, I'm going to tell it this way so that the patient comes back. I think maybe some people will do, but I think that's a very small minority because in general, I think people get into PT school not to make money because that'd be really stupid because we don't make that much money either. Right? <laughs> uh, very true. And um, also like there, I don't remember the exact study, but there was a study that was done, I think in 2017, where they, um, they asked people to, I don't know if you've heard of that study, they, they put white noise and they gave people a button and they were, and they were like, there's Bing Crosby in that music. When you hear it, like when you hear it coming out in the audio, just press the button. And like a third of the people press the button, but it was just white noise. So basically as if you prompt people to notice something, they're gonna notice it whether it's there or not. It's like pareidolia. Um, so for the SIJ, there is stuff moving. It's just not identified. Like we can't identify it in a way that's reliable. So people are gonna project what they wanna see. So if you have pain on the right, I guess it's not moving on the right. That's as simple as it's gonna be. When I was a physio, probably in my second year out of university, I did a course that was kind of based around the SIJ and how you could effectively palpate it and check whether it was moving too much or too little. And I remember being at that course and, you know, even a few hours into it, I was just like, this has got to be bullshit. You know, like he's trying to teach us that, you know, a stalk test or whatever, that the SIJ is yeah. moving too much and too little. And he's like, look at that. It's, it's moving too much or too little. And I'm just like, how the fuck do you even see that? You, you're literally yeah. making shit up. And yeah. like trying to do all of these corrective exercises based on this assessment. And you're just like, how are you coming to that conclusion? You're literally yeah. having a guess. And yeah. I actually is, looked, yeah, go ahead. No, you go. So I actually looked at the literature on uh, how precise our hands are. And they looked at like uh, two point discrimination and the error of measure that we have, like the smallest distance between our nerve receptors is actually, <laughs> it's bigger than the distance that the SI drain moves. So it's like, if you think that you can palpate, even if it was like uh, the skeleton, it's impossible to palpate. Cause it's like measuring a ruler, like measuring a small distance with a big ruler. It doesn't make sense at all. Um, so it's like, it's insane that like they're, they've been able to take the concept that far. I don't get it. Yeah. And I see it so often, you know, people come in and they say, oh, my SIJ is out of place or my hips are out of place. So it's, it's clearly still out there. People are telling clients and patients this regularly. And, you know, it's frustrating because people come in and it takes a while for you to debunk that and change their, their stance on that. And they, you know, you can't go in too hard too early with that as well, because they'll think you're an idiot because they probably trusted the original clinician 
So it, it's a really tricky thing to get across, but it's frustrating that we even need to talk about this and debunk it because it just clearly isn't an issue. Yeah. I'd say that's probably one of the most frustrating jobs. It's like having to, like you're trying to help someone and they think you're trying to like scam them, whereas it was possibly the opposite that was happening. It's like, no, I don't know. I don't want to talk shit about other therapists too much, but like, come on. The Talberg study was in 1998. Like people should be aware of it right now. And I think what Toledo did, uh, replicated it in 2020 and showed the same thing that like, we can't correct it. So like, whatever. I just hope it dies. Uh, That's my wish for the new year. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I really want it to die. Now, some people will probably want to ask if they are, these people are going in and getting their SIJ manipulated, which is complete crap, but they feel better after it. Why do they feel better after this supposed manipulation? I mean, there's so many effects behind it. It's probably just the neurophysiological effect. I mean, human touch and movement feel good. Um, I think for an EOA did this study in 20, like 2008, and they compared actual manual therapy to just leaving your hands there for nine minutes versus like actual active manual therapy for nine minutes, and they showed no difference. So, so it's like, it's literally just human touch yeah. uh, that's doing most of it. The other is just the positive expectation. And sometimes people feel like discredited when you tell them that, but I mean, Bingle and all that is study in 2011 where they they basically told, they gave people an opiate and they told them like, this is going to make your pain better or it's going to make your pain worse. And if they told them it's going to make it better, the pill was twice as effective. If they told them it's going to make it worse, the pill did nothing. And that was like an opiate. <laughs> so like your expectations are probably more powerful powerful than anything that our hands can do. Um, so you're obviously going to get a bit of placebo, but I think the other underlying message there is that when you are doing hands-on treatment, it doesn't have to be very specific at all. Agreed. Yeah. And, you know, when I do manual therapy, most of what I do is like, where does it hurt? And we're going to try to move that within, you know, a little bit of discomfort or, you know, in a way that makes it feel better. I'm not going to be like, oh, am I making this move better or making L5 supinate or whatever? <laughs> That's not <laughs> the correct terminology, but yeah, like, yeah. I literally don't think about it. Um, yeah. I, yeah. And it's empowering in a way as well as a clinician knowing that you don't have to be specific because specificity just isn't a thing when it comes to manual therapy. So like I'll often say to my clients, you know, you can achieve a similar result in terms of the hands-on stuff just at home with your partner or yourself, or, you know, you can get a very similar change and not, you know, pay a fortune for these special hands-on treatments. So, which is very powerful as a, as a clinician, but it's also powerful for the client. Yeah. And also tell, tell them that like, you know, the overlapping effects of manual therapy and exercise mean that like, it's like you can take takeout at home, like take the manual therapy list exercises probably going to do have like similar effects. Um, so yeah, it's like teaching someone to cook instead of bringing them to the restaurant. <laughs> very true. Now in terms of back pain, so we discussed in the yes, no, or maybe questions that some people with back pain actually have a stronger and more active core than people that don't have back pain because of the muscle guarding. And that's backed up by a lot of the work that Peter O'Sullivan's done and also Darren Beal's pelvic girdle work. Let's just jump into that because you often see it with clients. They come in and they're walking in like a plank of wood. They're really rigid and stiff. They've been told probably by another therapist that their core's weak um and they're coming in and they're just super stiff and guarded the whole time why is it such a powerful message for us to get across to these people to actually relax and do the opposite of what they're probably being told um because i think if we look at people because you're talking about people with chronic low back pain yeah um, exactly people with chronic pain are often caught they're often caught in like a cycle i think our jobs as clinician is to maybe break that cycle for a, a little bit so that they can get a rest from the pain and sometimes doing something a little bit different. So it's like, Hey, you've been avoiding this for a while. Let's like do something different for a different for a bit. And then they get better, but it's also sets up, sets them up for like, uh, what's the opposite of failure sets them up for like victory later. Cause success. Uh, it, yeah, it sets them up for success later. Cause you know, it, you teach them about self-management, how the body is strong. So when I have people with chronic low back pain, often the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get them to bend down. Yeah. Um, if they're like fear avoidant. Um, I do it in a way that's tolerable, obviously. And then I explain that, yes, maybe they hurt their back this way, but 
maybe it's because they, they haven't done it in years. And often that's what people tell me. They're like, I haven't bent that way in years. And it's like, yeah, okay, so why do you think you get injured? Um, you know, when you do it for the first time in a few years. I mean, I mean it doesn't mean they're going to get injured, but maybe if they practice more, uh, it's less likely that they're going to get injured because we have good data by, uh, was it Franken and all in 2021 that, that showed that repeated flexion by rowers uh, thicken the disc and make it more resilient. So avoiding it maybe atrophies the disc. I know that's not the correct term, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And I've heard Peter O'Sullivan use this analogy before in terms of the muscle guarding. You know, if you walk around, I use this with my clients as well. If you walk around with your fist clenched like this all day, yeah. And then at the end of the day, you try and pick something up or shake someone's hand, it's going to be pretty difficult because all the muscles are just effectively they're fatigued. Same thing with someone's back. You know, if they're constantly guarding when they're sitting, standing, when those muscles are ready to go and actually need to be used, they're already fatigued. Yeah. And because they're fatigued, it's going to be hard for them. And you'll see like your classic patient is the one that comes in and they're really stiff, you know, and they feel stiff and they're avoidant of flexion. They don't want to bend forward. And I, I think a lot of the time clinicians are making things worse by telling them about the fact that, you know, they think that their core's weak because they've got back pain. And like that's been debunked so long ago in terms of the transversus abdominis. Can we just dive into that quickly as well? Because going through physio school for me back in 2008, I started. Um, that was even that was still being taught. The oh, fact I that, to, yeah. Yeah. So that was getting taught the fact that transversus abdominis, you should train that in isolation with multifidus. And I remember doing it at university and I was struggling to even switch things on perfectly. And I was just thinking, this is complete crap. Like, surely this isn't the elixir. So let's just dive into. <laughs> Let's dive into that and why it's just really unwise to even bother going in, down that route. Um, I think it was, it's like the same as the gluten abstract studies. It's like, it was one study that found some results. And then when they try to replicate it, they did it like seven times. They found the opposite the other times. Um, so I think one, the, that happens often. I think Rio did the same thing with their isometrics. I don't think there was like, it was ill intention. It's just sometimes when you get a good result, that's surprising. People, the media just runs with it and then it becomes a myth before we can debunk it. Um, I don't know how the we could fight that, maybe like putting a cap on the media, like, okay, we can only divulge the info to the media when we've got three good studies. <laughs> that's never gonna happen, but it's just, it's na human nature. You know, when you find something new, it makes the news and it becomes a myth. And it's harder to debunk a myth than it is to provide good information where it's like, a, an information desert. I think it's 17 years to, pro to bring information to practice. Uh, that's from a paper in 2015 or 2011. Um, but it takes 42 years to correct something that, that was established as a myth. So like, you know, the, the, there's spinach, like there's iron in spinach. That's because someone missed a, a decimal. So there's actually not that much uh, iron in spinach, but to this day, we still think that that's true. Like I've heard doctors recommend that. Yeah, right. and it's, it's been like 150 years that we know that that's not true. So, yeah, and I I remember even just seeing during my placement years some clinicians that I was, I suppose, watching, um, do some of these transverse abdominus stuff, and I'm just like, surely there's better use of your time than teaching someone how to activate a small, well, it's not small, but a deep muscle of your core versus you know, giving them some pain education, uh, getting them to understand what they can do themselves to help themselves, getting them to yep. move effectively. And I was just tearing my hair out. And I remember even just in clin in practice when I started, I, I was just like, look, I'm not even going to touch this stuff. I'm going to go complete opposite way. I'm going to get people to move. And I'm like, people get better quicker. You know, you're not, you're not overcomplicating things. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. And, um, but I, but I think, yeah, it's, it's first of all, it's prima facie, it's kind of stupid. <laughs> but yeah, I think the reason um, it went so well now that I think of it is also because McGill, McGill's work, like his papers like showed that abdominal stabilization helped, but then he was like, okay, it helped because my theory was true that we're correcting some instability. But then the papers came out showing that, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do for low back pain as long as you're moving uh, frequently. 
but then he just can't admit that maybe it wasn't for the reasons he thought. And then Alexander Green came out with some papers in 2018 and 2019 where he compared chronic low back pain people to random, to pain-free people uh, on dynamic imaging. And there was no like more shear between the vertebra. They were moving the same. There were not, there were no like micro instability. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know why. It's just some people get famous with proving, proving something. And I'm doing like, uh, what's that called? Like quotation marks. Uh, and then they just can't go back on their, their words. I'd say like that Peter O'Sullivan is one of the exceptions. He's one of the rares who was like, oh yeah, I was wrong. Uh, yeah. Never mind. This is better. Credits and, to him. Yeah, hundred percent. And you, you have to do that as well. You need to be open to changing your opinion over time if you're in any type of healthcare. So I, I agree. He's changed his tune. You know, even when he was chatting to Jared Powell on um, Jared's, um, on shoulders of giants you know he even said that himself you know like i was wrong and i had to change my thinking um, but good clinicians yeah. do that they change you have to in regards to palpation skills a lot of therapists will hate hearing that and they'll think that we're having a go at them but the research backs that up in terms of palpation skills being really pretty unreliable and not very accurate and there's been some studies yeah. done where they've gotten therapists of different um, experience to try and palpate certain areas on the body. And we're quite inaccurate at doing that. doesn't matter in terms of experience either. Even the most experienced people in some of those studies weren't very good at actually um, finding the right spot. Now, yeah. one question with this, why do you think that's a good thing for a physio to understand? Because I personally think it's a great thing to understand because it's kind of empowering in a way. Um, because you can focus on more important things in the okay. biopsychosocial model. Like if you're, I, I think if you're basing your uh, treatment on palpation beyond like painful palpation, like, you know, if you're looking at the meniscus, painful palpation is a good sign. Like, where is your pain? Does this hurt? Yes, that's reliable palpation, but the, there's patient feedback. If you're just using palpation of what you feel with your hands, first of all, it's not going to give you reliable results. And second of all, you're kind of looking for the wrong thing because you usually use that to give manual therapy and manual therapy's effects are non-specific. So it's like, why are you using a specific test to do something non-specific? It kind of makes no sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, you sent me some stuff before we did this podcast about the 2015 Wessinger um, et al study that suggests that physical therapists are even less reliable than we thought when blinded to which side was painful, they tend to correctly identify painful shoulder correctly only 33 percent of the time based on visual observation of the scapula and so yeah. you know we've seen this multiple times we're not very good at you know deciding which side is affected if we don't know which side is the affected side um and yeah. we even sent that the one in plumber by plumber in 2017 it was 12 percent more likely to diagnose scapular dyskinesis if they were told that a patient had shoulder pain than they than if they weren't told where the patient's pain was or not. So in short, like people see what they want to see, you said in the document you sent me, yeah. I completely agree that if you're a corrective exercise expert, you probably shouldn't be, um, you're not really finding anything to correct, are you? No, not at all. But now I don't think we're talking about how patient we're talking about observation, I think. Yeah, that's the observation stuff, but it was leading me into the dyskinesis. Okay, part. okay that we wanted to go into. So scapular dyskinesis and the fact that the, that in terms of a diagnosis doesn't really exist. Let's just dive into that. Um, and why, yeah. why you think so many physios out there blame people's shoulder pain on so-called scapular dyskinesis? Um, because it makes sense from like a patho anatomical point of view, but we just see, we saw that it doesn't pan out like the impingement uh, theory doesn't really make sense if you think about it. Um, like about 50% of people have impingement in their shoulder. So like everyone would be in pain if that's a problem. And I think there's a paper that came out this year that showed that um, what's actually correlated with pain is the tendon thickening. It's not actually the smaller space and the chromium space, uh, subacromial space. Uh, but most of all, I think it makes sense for a therapist to, it's just because it's something they can observe and feel smart by doing. Because like, 
if you're just telling the person, you know, like get to moving and you're probably going to feel better as long as it's tolerable. Um, some people's reaction are like, oh, well, I, you know, I have this degree. I'm smart in this. It's like, well, you don't need to be smart if it's, if it's simple. Um, and I feel like it's, that's the thing. I, I feel like a lot of physios are choosing treatments that are empowering for them instead of treatments that are empowering for the patient. And uh, for me, honestly, it was really an easy pill to swallow that scapular dyskinesis was kind of bullshit because whenever I was looking at it, it was like, well, I can't say, I can't tell which side is moving right. I can't tell if I've corrected it. And most of all, like the patients don't understand like the stupid exercise. I, yeah. I was like, I'm going to, they're going to go home and do it completely wrong. So what is this even a good idea, even if it's the right, the right theory is like, I don't think so. And, and also um, you're not changing kinematics as well. If you do do so-called no. corrective exercises versus just doing the loaded approach, aren't we? No. So, so if you look at, um, the systematic review, but Takeno did in 2019, they show that motor control exercises up, but the, the way the scapular, scapular belt moved was exactly the same before and after. So basically people got better, but not because they, moved, they were moving any different. And one of the ways the myth spread was that if you look at people in pain, they're gonna move a bit differently, just because they're at the F pain. Like if you, have a, if you sprain your ankle, you're gonna move differently. And if you didn't, but it, for the scapula, for some reason, it's like, you're seeing someone in pain and it's like, oh, you sprain your ankle because you're limping. Whereas it's, no, I'm limping because I sprained my ankle, you know? Uh, and that becomes problematic because there were systematic reviews that looked at that and they were like, yeah, there's a correlation between shoulder pain and moving your scapula different. And that was the bunk last year by Ogan who did a systematic review, but he only saved the um, pers uh, uh, perspective study. So he looked at people before they had pain and you check whether they would develop pain and well, basically they did it. So it didn't matter how they move their, their scapula. It's probably just like, like eye color. You know, some people have blue eyes, some people have brown eyes, some people move their scapula some way, some others other ways. It probably has more to do with the, the sports you're doing. So they found, they found that like, you know, overhead athletes tend to have more uh, shoulder pain, but it's probably because they're, it's not because they're moving their shoulder different. It's just probably because they're using it more. There are more, there's more opportunities to get injured, you know? Yeah, it's just more load on the shoulder. There you go. Yeah. yeah. And it moves differently because it adapted. But that's it. Yeah. And I, there was a, I forget who it was done by, but there was a study done on professional swimmers where it showed, I think it was 95% of professional swimmers have a swollen subacromial bursa, but only a small proportion of those people had pain. Um, so, you know, when people come in and they're like, oh, I've got a subacromial bursa that's swollen, that's why I've got pain. I'm like, well, maybe you don't, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have pain and it's actually kind of designed to swell. So, um, yeah. that, that in itself, isn't necessarily the cause of pain. And you were talking about the Hogan 2021 systematic review just then. And you said with the stuff you sent me that there was no causal link between sc scapular kinematics and injury or onset of shoulder pain. Um, which kind of effectively still debunk it debunks the whole scapular dyskinesis model. And I still remember as a clinician when I was early in my career, being in with a more experienced clinician, experienced, and um, watching them go through a shoulder assessment and saying, "Oh, this shoulder does this. You know, it, it wings more. It does this. This is why they've got pain." And I just thought, I can't see the difference. Like, yeah left versus right just because the person's got pain on the right it's kind of like they're seeing things that don't even exist and aren't even there like if you blinded someone to that and was like pick the side that's painful it'd be pretty hard to figure it out just by seeing the shoulder move or the shoulder blade move yeah. it kind of pisses me off and i think this is somewhat similar to the sij stuff it's just making therapists feel more important than they really should be <laughs> and 100%, make, yeah. making them feel smarter than they are yeah and i think part of the, the reason that it's so prevalent in physio is i think um like if you take a bunch of lawyers i don't think it'd be that bad because lawyers tend to be really argumentative but in physio it's nice people want to help so they're i think they fall prey to group think a lot so in school i was i don't think i was very like appreciated and <laughs> with reason but most physios just want to get along and like be friends so they're not going to raise their hand and contradict the big teacher with the beard. They're going to go like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And they're not going to make waves, uh, which, you know, is helpful for to create a link with the patient, which is really important. But in terms of research and bring the profession forward, I think we need 
a bunch of vassals to you know kind of disagree with the the status quo because the status quo is pretty bad uh, in my opinion. I think like what forty three percent of physios don't adhere by uh, best practice guidelines. The paper yeah. that came out in twenty sixteen, yeah, and ninety six percent do unsupported treatment. So. It's shocking. I just don't understand why so many clinicians are so far behind in terms of the research. And surely, you know, they've got they've got to change their thinking because the amount of times I see it where people are coming in and they've got these preconceived notions by the things that they've been told by other clinicians, you're just tearing your hair out, thinking, "What the hell? Come on, we can be better than this as a as a profession." Um, yeah. now, in terms of going after pseudoscience and bullshit. You're the king of it in terms of your Instagram. <laughs> um, I say Adam Meekins is the king, but I'm, uh, I'm going to take his place. I'm kidding. All yeah, right. You can be the queen. Um, oh, yeah, in, yes. terms, <laughs> in terms of that, in terms of that approach online, obviously you've yeah. been going pretty hard at a certain few people and I'm more than happy for you to mention these people. Why do you go so hard at these people? Are you just like me, completely frustrated with the fact that people even listen to these so-called experts? Um, for me, it's more like, uh, you know the term like sublimation? It's like when you turn something negative into something positive. Um, I was like spending so much time arguing online and probably just bringing more traction to the big stupid pages. Yeah. So I was like, I'm gonna do this on my page and maybe get some attention to actual good messages. Uh, so that's how it started because it was getting to the point where it's frustrating with patients because it, it was like some clinician said something stupid and I was there with my frustration with the patient so now at least I can do that online and not have the that come with me in the in the clinic um, but the reason is like uh, the reason I go so hard is that to me and that came about really clearly during COVID is just uh, people who are like um really arrogant about their knowledge. Like I'm, I'm more than happy to say that like I'm stupid sometimes and that I'm wrong. Like I had a conversation with uh, Greg Lehman recently and like, you know what, he was, <laughs> he was right about the stuff we like discussed a little bit. And I was like, hey, you're right. And I changed my mind and I'm fine with that. But then there's these people with like absolutely no qualification. And that, that's fine with me. There's some people who have no degrees who are super smart but they bring scientific studies to the table. Um, it's people who have like no science, no experience, and all they're doing is just spouting nonsense and that works. So like functional patterns, I completely hate them. I think they're stupid. And I've I got a lot of cases of people who have been abused by them, like injured. I got a, a couple of guys telling me they were sleeping four hours for months because they were worried about sleeping wrong and moving wrong. Like at all times, they were all looking out, they were moving. And like the instructor was like, I keep moving, like keep doing that movement. And we're like, I'm in pain. Or like, keep at it. And then they tore the hamstrings. And, you know, it's these people, you know, that's completely not, it's complete nonsense. And it doesn't, it isn't backed by the, the data. And I think what did it for me is I think I was talking to move you before they blocked me. They were, they said something like, um, something about like, we would eat their fumes because they were trailblazers. It's like, no, you're applying the Janda model. That's been debunked like yes. years and years ago. And you're acting like it's new. Like I learned what you learned in school. I just learned it was stupid and I'm, at least have the humility to admit I was wrong, but you don't. And you're just like, I don't know if you've seen their videos recently, but they're like, this is a problem that it's, it's not a problem according to the data. And it's like, and you need to get a program to fix it. And I don't know. I really think that people have like bad intentions, but I think that move you does have bad intention. At least Mike, uh, Mike, if you're listening to this, I, I hate you and you're stupid. <laughs> Straight up, honestly, go fuck yeah. yourself. Yeah, it's a fair point. And I get so frustrated online when I see bullshit because a lot of people believe it. You know, they look at someone's qualifications in their Instagram bio and they believe it. Like even just some of the stuff that Joel Seedman does and like you did a post today, I think, and you just literally like tearing your hair out thinking, how the fuck do people even believe this shit? Like that, that video yeah. of him doing a... It's it's kind of like having a uh, triple decker. He's, he's got a safety bar on his shoulders. Yeah, and he's doing like a trap bar deadlift at the same time, but holding it mid range. Yeah, and you're like, yeah. what are you doing? And like when you when they're doing like a safety bar squat mid range with the bicep curl and shit like that, I'm just like, how yeah. how are people believing this shit? Uh, 
I mean, I think a lot of people are not informed, but also, um, have you seen the papers? There were two people, papers done on uh, social media algorithms. There was one on Twitter and one on Facebook, and they both showed that um, false information spreads faster than uh, truthful information. And one of the reasons they theorized was that false information is just more novel. And the brain tends to like stuff that's more novel. So it's going to reward it because it brings traction. There's a lot of people I know who follow him because they're like, I want to see what stupid shit he does next. And um, I mean, I don't want to get political, so I'm not going to say what I'm thinking, but like, I think some politicians can bank on that and get elected, even though what they're saying is nonsense. Um, so yeah, I think that's how they prosper. And I, I honestly think that Facebook and other platforms should tweak the algorithm or should be forced by governments to tweak the algorithm to reward real information, or at least punish very severely information that's inexact. So maybe they have like a group of experts uh, hand out penalties that are very severe, just like they did for the food industry. Um, yeah. Or, uh, I don't know, they reward good sources of information. So maybe they give you like, you know, there's a blue check mark. They just give that to people who are legit and the others don't. And then you get more traction if you can get managed to get approved. Kind of like a social media uh, trustful uh, label or something. Yeah. And but I'm not an expert, so. And you see so many amazing accounts that have a small following, you know, yours is a great example, you know, it's 5,000, I think, followers I checked before. Um, and you compare that to some of those people that are spruiking pseudoscience bullshit and, you know, they're in the hundreds of thousands. It's hard to build a following when you're yeah. sprouting effectively science, you know, and you're yeah. doing the right thing. You're giving people the right information you're not spruiking bullshit and pseudoscience and making things look cool and all this sort of stuff and just creating more barriers to exercise such as Joel Seedman um, than we need to. So it, I completely agree. Something needs to happen in terms of the algorithm because it's just rewarding these idiots. Yeah. And the, the, the reason, another reason is just, it takes more time. Like when I do a post that's educational, like the odd educational post, it, I like it. I look at the research because I don't want someone to come in and be like, hey, but this was wrong. And if it is, like, I, I'll gladly admit and, like, put a correction in the caption. Um, but, you know, I do the research. Whereas if you look at most accounts, like, Squat U is a huge platform. And I, I'm probably made, like, penis jokes with more references than any of this post in the last, like, three months. I think he cited three papers in the last month. And it was, like, papers done in China in, like, the 1980s on, like, wooden shoes. <laughs> Like, I don't get it. He has such a huge platform. You can just get an intern to do the research for him instead yeah. of complaining on his tweets that, you know, we're not being professional for criticizing him. And yeah, that's the one thing I don't get with those big platforms. I could say the same thing about Joe Rogan and all of these guys. It's like, I understand, okay, maybe you did it. You were a bit loosey goosey with the science to get that big. But once you're big, you've got the money and Squat U does have interns. Like, why don't, why doesn't he ask them to do the research? It's super easy. And like news station do it all the time. And I'm, you could do it and like there'd be a hundred applicants who'd be like, yeah, I'll check the sources for you and give you like good solid info, but he doesn't. So that's why I have a problem with that. It's like, you can do it, but you don't, you willfully choose to promote stupid information, uh, which I don't get. Yeah. Agreed. Completely agree. Now um, let's dive into some trigger point stuff. So we discussed a little bit in the yes, no, or maybe questions about the fact that trigger points really should be just referred to as sore spots within a muscle. And this has been showed with several studies that, therapists just are not very good at knowing where things are sore within a muscle unless the client tells them. Um, let's just dive into that when you're ready in terms of, you know, what are we actually feeling when we feel something that feels sore to a client within a muscle? Yeah. Um, so far, I don't think we can know what's happening. Uh, my biases is probably just nerve sensitization, but it might be for chemical reasons. So there's if you look at, there's some studies that show that there might be like a focal point of like inflammatory materials and cytokines in the heart that's sensitive. I think I hate Brooke Bush, but like he did a decent post about this. That's really rambling, but he brings up a point. Uh, so there might be something, but the question is, can we identify it without, you know, the patient telling us that it's sensitive? No, we can't. And that's been proven by the uh, what is it? It's the Wolf paper in 1992, where they asked the people who invented trigger points to, uh, I think it was Simmons, because it's travel in Simmons, to identify them. And if the patient was blind, he couldn't identify where, where it was. So literally the best in the world couldn't do it. So I don't think 
your guy around the corner can. Um, and uh, yeah, so it might be something chemical. So I don't think that trigger points necessarily don't exist. I just think we can't necessarily identify them. And if you look at the literature, even if we could, I don't think it makes a difference because the, I mean, Navarro Santana did a systematic review in 2020 on uh, trigger point dry needling for the, the neck. And he showed that it was maybe making a difference when you compare it to sham or no control, uh, but that was only very short term. And that's model because he also used no control, grouped them in the same category of uh, comparison as sham. So like if it was just a sham, my, my bias is that it would not have made a difference. But if you compare it to the no control, everything's gonna be better. I could literally just uh, do a woo -woo 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 around you and it'd probably be super effective uh, compared to nothing because people like to be taken care of and that's powerful. So I don't know. Yeah. And, uh, I think the other thing, a lot of clients will tell you that they've got muscle knots, but like a muscle can't knot. It's not just going to create this big <laughs> knot and then like knot up. And then just because we stick our fingers on them or we stick a needle in it, the muscle then unravels and it, then it isn't a knot. You know, it's just a yeah. soft spot. And as, I, as you said, you know, it's just a neurological thing by the looks yeah. of it, what we know so far. Yeah, and it doesn't go away with, with treatment as far as I know. So like if you look at the Erickson and Cormer paper in 2015, they, they did do the massage. And if you did it for seven minutes, the muscle tension would go down immediately after. But if you came back two minutes later of just the patient resting on the table, it was exactly the same. So the, the tension comes back, which is good because like your muscle is supposed to be tense. Like that's what it's, its purpose is. It's like to support the joints and all that. So if it was flaccid, that wouldn't be a good thing. You wouldn't feel great if, if you did. In fact, people who have flaccid muscles feel terrible because they have like a neurological disease. And the, the simple way I explain it to patients is like, you know, bodybuilders have very strong, stiff muscles, but they're not like constantly in pain. So like, why, why do you think that's an issue for you? It's probably not stiff. Like the message from their brain is reliable and real. Like the stiffness feeling is real, but it might not be um, related to something palpable. And I actually have like a post about it. It's more, it becomes very unclear if you're looking at chronic pain people. So chronic pain people in general tend to be a stiffer for real, but not acute pain people. Uh, if we exclude like muscle spasms and all that stuff that are in the very, very acute stages. Um, and, but, but it doesn't change with treatment. So the point is like, it might be different, but it's like, if you don't change it, why do you worry about it? It's like, oh, you, you know, you have one leg that's three centimeters shorter. It's like, are you going to operate it? No, but then why you measure it? Like, what does it change in your treatment? Yeah, exactly. Nothing. And, and the other, the other thing about, I suppose this whole trigger point theory is a lot of people start talking about not only releasing knots, but releasing fascia, um, <laughs> and using things like fascia blades and all this sort of bullshit. Um, yeah. How do you say, for instance, a client comes in and says, oh, I went to a clinician and they released my fascia. How do you debunk that? Um, I tell them, first of all, I always try to validate what the patient felt because you don't want to tell them that they're an idiot because they're not. Like, yeah. it's normal to believe that stuff because I, you know, I used to believe it. Um, I tell them, like, it's normal, but you probably felt some relief that's normal and the literature validates that like massage seems to have some uh, short effects on pain uh but if we look at the chaudry and all 2008 paper it takes like about 2,000 pounds to modify fascia by one percent so it's probably not happening in humans or at least not in a sustainable way so there might be like a neurological effect where the fascia kind of eases up um but it's probably not relevant to the effect of the treatment as we see from the chromate paper, chromate paper, chromate paper, Jesus. You got, you got there. Yeah. So if someone, yeah, if someone is getting some relief from, I suppose what clinicians would call some trigger point therapy or just some massage on the muscle. And also they're doing some scraping or something like that on their so-called fascia. Um, what mechanisms are at play? You've alluded to them already, but just to be clear, I don't think we can allude to one, but yeah, I think human touch and the psychological aspects are probably a lot of it. If you look at the studies that try to quantify that, I think positive expectations are a small part. Um, and then what is it? The context is a big one, but also there might be some effect of like localized blood flow, but it's probably not big because we, you know, it's a few percentage point, whereas walking is like two to four, two to six, sorry, increases in blood flow. So, I mean, it's probably not the main effect of a, of a massage or a fascial release uh, technique. 
Uh, and there might be, there are some studies, I think, if you look at neurological uh, effects of manual therapy studies, I think there's some uh, release of uh, anti-inflammatory stuff. I don't know if you've seen those papers. Like there's something chemically that's happening, but the literature is so haphazard and has like very methodologies. I don't think we can point to one substance in particular. It's not going to be like, oh, your dopamine's going up, but it's just <laughs> a bunch of stuff, inflammatory markers that are moving a little bit. Yep. But I'm already always skeptical of those studies because it's like, if it's moving, where's it going? <laughs> I guess it's just go moving up the leg and why don't you have pain in the leg then? I don't know. Yeah, and a lot of the time you're just giving the brain another signal with the touch. Yeah. You know, a lot of the diffuse noxious inhibitory control, you know, if you kick someone in the shin and their shoulder hurts, well, the shin starts to hurt more than the shoulder. So that's a big one. Yeah, that's a big one as well. And I often put it that way with clients, you know, if I did that, kicked your shin, well, your shoulder wouldn't hurt anymore for a few hours, probably because the shin's bloody aching. Um, yeah, yeah, good point. So I, I think that that is powerful. But also, I've talked about this on my podcast before, and you've just said it as well. If someone has a positive expectation that this will help them, e.g. massage, acupuncture, someone slapping them on the back 20 times, whatever it is, it'll probably help through placebo and they think that it's going to help and probably will. So yeah, um, yeah completely agree with that. Um, is, there, is there anything that you wanted to get through to all of the listeners that we haven't discussed? So something that you wanted to either debunk or some advice you've got for young clinicians? Um, good question. I wasn't expecting that. Um, Maybe it's for the people who like criticize me. It's just that I'm not even attacking what people are doing. Most of the time, I'm just attacking the narratives that they're they're giving. Because I, I think our roles as physio is more to guide people to, you know, they're probably going to get better on their own, but they need a little bit of guidance sometimes. And that can help short term, but we don't, you don't want to fuck them up long term. So say as little as you can in terms of like uh, no C big narratives. Like if you're not completely certain that it's going to make someone worse long-term, don't say anything. Uh, yeah, that, that, that'd be my, my thing. And maybe don't mention stuff that you can't change. So like if someone has like knee valgum, uh, like static knee valgum, yes, their chances of OA might be a little bit more elevated, but like, are you going to change it? No, you're not a surgeon and the surgery probably wouldn't help. So don't mention it and don't give her like theraben exercises to try to modify it if you can't because you can't spoiler alert um so yeah my, my advice is just like say as little as you can in terms of harmful language and just try to get people moving and i don't really care what people do as long as you know they're using the correct language that's it yeah communication and language is so important and you've already mentioned that you don't want to say anything that's going to hurt them long term and that is more of your nocebo um or yeah. ne negative beliefs let's just jump into that a little bit because words matter and saying something really simple will often have ramifications long-term with a client. Um, in terms of communication, how do you personally work on your communication skills? Uh, I mean, just practice. And then I read, I read papers and I listen to, uh, you know, Oliver Thompson. Yeah. Yeah. I listen to this podcast. You know, he talks about like a lot on like qual qualitative data. Uh, I'd say com communication is probably not my strong suit, but I've gotten better over the years. Um, but that's the thing that they don't teach you in school, but I think they should maybe take away the ultrasound and palpation classes and then give that <laughs> to communication and maybe going to the gym because that's more relevant. Yep. Because I think our mouth is probably the most powerful thing, tool that we can use in the clinic. Uh, and I don't mean like give kisses to the clients. I mean, just, you know, just talk to them like they're a human being. Um, yeah, what was the question again? I forgot, sorry. Well, <laughs> I think that the, the takeaway there is communication matters, but the, the question was, how do you work on your communication skills? But it sounds like you're doing all the right things. That's great. Um, but I think the number one thing for a clinician is probably learn to listen better. I think that a lot of clinicians are too eager to show off the, their knowledge and talk and talk and talk and talk rather than just let the client tell their story. You know, a lot of the time what we do is very much a psychological um, process 
and kind of like a psych consult in a way, you know, they want to tell their story and get things off their chest and, you know, you need to let them get, get that off their chest. Yeah. 100%. It's so powerful. Yeah. Have you seen the paper that shows that um, there's three papers on this where like they just gave people negative expectations and they measured how it affected their pain responses. And just one suggestion that, oh, it, they said like they, they gave people a painful sensation with heat and they came back, uh, they tested like every few days. And in one case they said like, this is not going to get better. And the other, they just said nothing. And the other, they said it was going to get better. And they showed that just the, if they said once, like, this is not going to get better, uh, <laughs> it didn't get better for 21 days. So maybe it's longer, but basically just one piece of shitty advice can set up people for failure for 21 days. Uh, pretty, so yeah, uh, it's important to not give people negative expectations if they don't need to have some. I remember when I was probably about four years out of uni, I went to a job interview and uh, part of the interview was uh, videos of clients of theirs on an iPad. And I had to decipher what was wrong with the client based on them either walking or doing a, you know, a shoulder movement or something like that. And I still remember it to this day, because as soon as that happened, I was like, no way am I going to work here because just some of the bullshit that they were going through and they were expecting me to understand and also just you're effectively guessing they're like no his adductor is causing a moment arm that's internally rotating this and that and his shoulder kinematics are off and all this and he's got more pain on the right than the left because of this his serratus anterior isn't working well enough on the right and i'm just like you can't even fucking tell like look at both yeah. sides if you knew nothing about the client you'd probably say hey the right side looks exactly the same as the left it looks pretty similar there aren't any issues really whatsoever. And I probably would have got it wrong, which side was the side that was affected. And Same. Yeah. like, I just, I still remember it. And he, I remember the guy doing the interview and he felt, he felt like he was validated in a way. And he felt really smart. The fact that I got a few things wrong. And he, it was kind of like I was being fobbed off and it was like, oh, it's clearly the, clearly the left side. You can see this this and this happen. I'm like, no, you can't. And I still remember because yeah. I actually questioned it. I was like, well, I can't see that at all. And I don't know how you can make that determination. And then he's like, oh, you'll get there with clinical um experience. Ugh. And I'm like, the girl. What? what? You surely yeah. you're not that arrogant that you think that you can see all of these things that are clearly just not even there. Yeah. What would tick me off when that, you know, in the clinic, the first thing they, t they teach you when you're a student is like, oh, like look at their gait and try to guess what's wrong. Now what I do is like, I don't even do that. Like I, I look at it a little bit, but I'm just like, you know, how can I help you? The patient's going to tell me, I'm not going to try to guess what their problem is. I'm not going to make up imaginary problems. Like just, it, we, we, they tell patient people like, oh, talk to the patient. Like they're, the, they're a person. And then you're trying to guess what's wrong with them. Like they're a little toy. It makes no sense. Like vets do that with dogs because do dogs can't talk, but like we can talk <laughs> to people. So why won't we do that? You know, this is <laughs> so dumb. This is a good question for you. Do you think, considering back pain is still such a major issue and it will continue to be a major issue in modern lifestyle and the modern world, do you think we've made yeah. things worse in the last 20 to 30 years? Uh, I think it's too multifactorial. I think we are industrialized life and like we become more sedentary, more obese. So I think that's probably contributing, although like obesity doesn't seem to be an isolated risk factor for, for low back pain. Um, I think we can't blame it on us, but I do think we have a part in it. Because if you look at people with chronic low back pain, they do have uh, no see big narratives and studies show that in almost all cases that was given by the other therapists. So a portion of it is our fault. I think there's a portion that's uh, people transition from acute low back pain to chronic low back pain. That's probably a lot of this is from clinicians. It might not be from physio specifically, like the Stevens and all uh, paper in 2021. Uh, have you seen that one? They looked at like risk factors for transition from acute to chronic. If you do, I think it's more than four non-guideline uh, based uh, practices on a patient. So like MRI or useless cortisone injection. Uh, there's a 53% increase in the risk of transition from acute to chronic. So in the medical sector, I'd say definitely there is an over, 
like medicalization problem. And there's another study, I think Jacob Templar sent it to me. It's like, if you live close to an MRI machine, you're more, much more likely to get a <laughs> lumbar surgery. Yeah. So it's like literally your worst off is there's more available to you in terms of low back pain. I think for other things, it's probably great to have an MRI. Like if you have cancer and stuff like that, that's wonderful. But for uh, just plain old low back pain, it's kind of stupid. Uh, we are, uh, yeah, so long, long-winded answer for yes, but I think it's more from doctors and physios. And I think there's a bunch of other factors that are responsible as well. Because 100 years ago, if someone had a bit of back pain, they'd just get on with it. You know, they wouldn't go and probably see a physio or because they didn't really exist. You know, they might have yeah. got a massage or something like that. And we and they didn't know much about pain science and all that sort of stuff back then. So um, yeah. they would have just effectively got on with it. And I'd, I'd love to, you know, be great to go back in time and see what people did around those periods of time in the, you know, 1700s, 1800s, when people did have pain, what was what was the narrative then? You know, just get on with it, harden up. <laughs> and then a lot of yeah. that acute pain, did it not turn into a chronic pain issue because there was a le- there was less of a focus on it? Yeah. And, le- and less wild. I'd be very curious. Yeah. It'd be it'd be really interesting. If we had if you had a time machine, that'd be a good way to a good thing to <laughs> would do. Would be the first thing I'd do with it. But yeah, yeah I think <laughs> imagine when we got a few things crossed off the list. You know, kill Hitler, um, you know prevent 9-11 and then go check about low back pain rates you know number three yeah yeah it'd have to be number three (laughs) yeah super important (laughs) let's let's go through one more thing i really appreciate your time alexis it's been great fun um subluxation theory that a lot of chiros spruik the fact that they do a sublux that they do a manipulation on a so-called sublux facet joint and it makes the client feel better and they tell the client that I've just put your subluxation back in. Let's just debunk. Yep. Let's debunk that because it pisses me off. Um, yeah. Um, so I mean, the theory is really old. It's from the <laughs> T.D. Palmer, uh, the one who invented Cairo in the, in the U.S. Uh, is the one that started it. And the idea is like that. You know, your vertebras being out of alignment is the cause of every disease and all that stuff apparently including COVID, according to some chiros in Colorado. Um, but yeah, it's been thoroughly debunked. Uh, Cascioli did a paper in 20, 2003, uh, and he showed that like um, a manip and a manip with traction didn't change the, the x-ray, the, the cervical spine position before and after. So it's just like you're moving the joint, it does this, and then it comes back to its regular position. Uh, and then if you look at Kotchuk in 2015, the sound that's provoked, we used to think it was a gap, uh, gas bubble collapsing. It's probably more tribonucleation, um, which is a, an air bubble forming uh, that causes the, the beep. Like the, what, what sound does it make? Like clock, I guess. Kind of like a little poppy uh, sound, I suppose. Poppy sound, yeah, that's it. Uh, and the, the subluxation theory, even if it was true, it's like you probably can't correct it with your hands because even if we do cavitations, the work by uh, Stuart McGill, he did it for osteopaths and chiros. He compared both uh, in the 2000s, like 2004, yeah, Francis and all 2014, and then Rosa and all in 2014, and they both show the same thing. So if you do a spinal manip, there's a two to six vertebras on average that cavitate. So it's like if the, the, the spine is out of alignment, you're trying to correct the affected segment, you'd be correct over correcting it. And now it's misaligned in the other direction, which makes no sense. Cause like either spinal manipul- manipulation doesn't work or it works, but not how you think. And if, it just doesn't make sense. Cause we can't be precise. So like <laughs> for osteopaths, 78% of manipulation results, resulted in the lower se- segment to cavitate as well. And the intended target of cavitation did not even correlate with the, the cavitation. So basically it's like, it's like you have a gun and you, it's like less than 50, 50 on correcting, killing the right one. You know, that, that, that scenario where you have the twin and he's like, no, I'm the real one. And it's like, yeah, you're going to get less than 50% of the time. So it's, you probably shouldn't shoot the bullet uh, yeah, based on that. I mean, you can, you can do spinal manipulation, but it's not going to work because you're correcting a subluxation. It just feels good because it's moving as we, we've talked about before and it's human touch and it's reassurance and you're, giving people uh, a license to move. You're like, yeah, I corrected it. You're fine. And they feel fine. I don't know. And, and if you see a patient or client that comes in and they've been a 
manip junky for years where they go back to a chiro or a physio, whoever it is, or an osteo week on week for years or months or however long it is, and they continue to get the manips. How do you go about trying to either wean them off it or try and get them to stop doing that because they just don't need it? Yeah, I call them crack addicts. Uh, I, uh, it depends. Uh, I see like how receptive they are to it. If they say like, sometimes they don't tell you all oh, right. Like I really don't like the Cairo. Like I feel bad when I get out. Then I'm like, okay, I'm going to educate right away. Um, and then also try to tweeze out if the, the Cairo is like, cause there's some good Cairo's out there. Like if they have a helpful narrative, I don't mind. Like if, yeah. if it makes them feel better, but if they go back every week, it's definitely not a good Cairo in my opinion. I haven't been doing that for years. Like, absolutely terrible uh, in my opinion uh i just show them the literature like that i just mentioned about but i don't go about it in one go because that i mean they're not gonna remember and they're not gonna they're gonna be like what's this guy talking about i'm in pain i don't want to hear about the stupid pain science stuff um so i sprinkle it if i have to uh or i try to if i only have one session i try to explain that you know if you look at chiro treatment for low back pain and then exercise it seems to be quite similar in terms of effect it's just exercise is free and it has more uh, secondary benefits. So it's like, do you want a pill that does 70 things that are all healthy? Or do you want the one that uh, just does one thing and is expensive? It's like, my choice is, I, it's pretty obvious I'm gonna choose the exercise. And uh, sometimes I also mention that like, if it's like a coin toss, cause I, I, I don't remember how much, but with spinal manipulations, there's a high percentage of people who feel soreness the first visit. It's like, it might make you feel better, but it could also make you feel more worse. Yeah. It's not like a, I don't know, it's not a betting man's thing you should do. Um, although I do suggest that for people who like it and expect it to work, uh, the data supports that it might work uh, better. So there's like the acupuncture, acupuncture and spinal manip study showed like an 80% uh, favor. Um, like it worked, it, it had 80% chance more of working if the person strongly believed in it. So for these people, I'm like, yeah, just sure. Go see your car if you really believe in it. But if they don't, I right away get them off the train. I'm like, you can see them if you have pain sometime, but like don't go every week because you're getting swindled. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Completely agree. And yeah, it's similar to what I do. I try and get them to wean off it because you see it so often, you know, people are been going to the car once a week or once a fortnight for months and months and years even. And you just think about how much money that they've spent when they could have done they could have done something so simple just to help themselves without spending all that money and it's a it's a very nasibic narrative as well that they're creating isn't it yep. which absolutely which can be which can be harmful long term yeah i'm pretty sure that they're they're probably creating a self fulfilling prophecy it's like oh you need to come back every week and it's like if they don't maybe they have more pain yeah because they didn't you know and whereas if they just said you know here's your manip like, oh, you feel better? Great, come back if you need to. Probably people will feel better. And I think the data would support that narrative. If we go back to that study that shows that, you know, your pain reduction is affected for 21 days for a single negative suggestion. So again, I don't have anything against chiros. I have, a, I have something against bad chiros where you, where you use like harmful language. Agreed. And I think that's not only just chiros, it's physios, osteos, any type of health practitioner that does create- 100%, yeah create that dependence model and you know they're using a lot of nasibic language to effectively not necessarily help their client as much as they really could and they're creating that dependence model so no i agree i agree um alexis i think we should leave it there what's it been just over an hour or so um is there yeah. anything is there anything else you would like to discuss or any final thoughts or words of wisdom for all of the young physios out there uh if you have a choice to study physio anywhere in the world you should probably go to australia <laughs> from what i've seen you guys seem to be doing the best honestly including cairo right i don't know how you did it but compared to canada and the u.s it seems to be much better except like some specific schools in the u.s like duke is pretty good uh and maybe the uk like england is great uh for chiros and osteopaths uh but yeah i don't know what you guys did over there i don't know if it's because of the new zealand influence and the Maitland influence, but you guys are doing great uh, compared to the rest. I mean, there's some bad Australian physios, no, no question, but in general, it seems much better than 
whatever we have in Canada and the, the States. Yeah, I, I think it's heading in the right direction. And the last podcast I did was with, uh, actually two podcasts ago, I did with uh, three new grad students that had just finished uh, physio at uni. And they all mentioned that there has been a decent shift towards this more active um, focus, which is obviously doing less of your hands-on work and more exercise and getting people lifting and all that sort of stuff. So I think it's heading in the right direction. It's probably taken a bit too too much time in my opinion to get there but um yeah we're doing okay i think we've still got a long way to go um but i think the other thing that maybe influences it is just how much sport we play here as well maybe that might influence really? it a little bit because there's just so many people that want to do physio there's such a demand maybe that has an influence on it as well i don't know maybe because afl is so violent that you have, you just have so many injuries to cover everyone that like everyone's so violent yeah, it's pretty high. I'm pretty sure from the literature, I'm pretty sure Nepal has maybe a high injury rate potentially, um, but it's close to Aussie rules. Yeah. But a lot of people think we're mad for playing Aussie rules. That was my game. And well, it looks awesome. Yeah, it's a great game. It's, uh, it's very much like I watched ice hockey when I came to the States a few years back and I was like, structurally, it's reasonably similar to ice hockey in a way. It's, it's pretty quick and it's really skillful and, um yeah it's a great game it's a really good game i want to watch one when i come to australia yeah well when you come to australia you have to pop into sydney and uh we'll have a we'll catch up in person we'll do an in-person podcast oh damn i'm excited all right i'm done all right i'll Thanks. be coming for my friend's wedding soon so whatever sounds good we'll keep me posted uh where can all the listeners find you i've already alluded to it. it's no bullshit physio on instagram <laughs> Yeah, so I'm there on Instagram and also have the Pragmatic Rehab Principles that I'm watching with uh, Rehab Cairo and Jacob Templar. So Elliot, Sarah, and Jacob Templar. Uh, it's an educational platform because we're trying to bridge the gap between uh, schools and just practice because we feel like there's a big uh, gap over there, especially for Cairo's who most of them, we did a survey and like, I think most school, almost all schools only had one course, if any, of exercise. And all the practice guidelines say you should focus on exercise for musculoskeletal rehab. So it's like they don't know how to do it. So we're hopefully trying to help in yeah. that part for new grads. Sounds great. Highly recommend that for sure. It sounds like a great option for a lot of young students and uh, clinicians out there. This podcast is live on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Amazon. Any final thoughts, Alexis? No, I'm good. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks again yeah. for your time. And we'll, uh, we'll definitely do it again soon. Thanks for having me. My absolute pleasure. As usual, guys, Bye. stay strong.